Uh, well, we, we have had an excellent conversation. Uh, this group, in part, represents the 21st century policing task force that I put, uh, put together after Ferguson in order for us to find constructive steps that we could take that law enforcement and communities could get behind in order to make sure that we're keeping our streets safe and we are protecting and supporting pol police officers who are doing a very difficult job and we can make sure that uh, our communities are being treated fairly uh, and that people have confidence that the law applies to everybody equally. Uh, thanks to uh, Lori Robinson and Charles Ramsey and the members of that task force, we came up with a set of recommendations. And the good news is, is that over the last uh, several months since uh, the report was issued, we have seen uh, a lot of law enforcement officers, a lot of chiefs, a lot of departments begin to examine these recommendations and figure out how they can implement them. We've, we've seen real progress with respect to data gathering. We've seen real progress with respect to training. We've seen progress with respect to transparency and outreach to communities. The bad news is, uh, as we saw so painfully this week, uh, that this is a really hard job. We're not there yet. We're not even close to being there yet, where we want to be. We're not at a point yet where uh, communities of color feel confident that their police departments are serving them uh, with dignity and respect and equality, and we're not at the point yet where police departments feel uh, adequately as supported uh, at all levels. So what we've done here is to build off the task force report and find out what's working, what's not, and what more do we have to do in order to bring the country and communities around the country together uh, and make more progress on this front. And I'll just characterize a couple of things that have been identified. Uh, and I want to emphasize that there's still a diversity of views around this table. That was by design. We have police chiefs and representatives of, uh, representatives of rank and file uh, law enforcement. We've got people who have been protesting just this week. Uh, and we have sociologists, civil rights attorneys, uh, governors, state legislatures. So as you might expect, not everybody agrees uh, on everything. But, but here are the buckets of issues that everybody identified as, as worthy of uh, more work, more study, and ultimately, more action. Uh, number one, we're going to have to do more work together in thinking about how we can build confidence that after uh, police officers have used force, and particularly deadly force, that there is confidence in how the investigation takes place and that justice is done. Now, that's a complicated piece of work, but it's going to involve engaging with police departments and state's attorneys, as well as communities themselves, and potentially shaping a set of best practices that ensure when something happens that people feel like it's being investigated effectively and fairly both for the police officer, but also for uh, the families of those who've uh, been affected. And, and, and so one of our charges, I think, is to try to find effective ways uh, to do that. Second is continuing work on uh, working with police departments around training, which we emphasized in the uh, initial task force, but also hiring uh, recruitment, uh, and uh, one of the themes that came from a number of people is how do we support uh, police officers 
not just in terms of eliminating bias, but also dealing with uh, the stress and, and strains of the job so that they have the capacity to interact with communities and de-escalate more effectively. Uh, and uh, are there ways for us to resource that? So that was bucket number two. Third is data. Uh, although we put forward a data initiative that is beginning to gather uh, information about what's happening in police departments so that they can do a better job managing their force and ensure that what they're doing is effective uh, and so that communities can feel confident that they know what's happening with police uh, forces. Uh, generally speaking, uh, police departments, sheriff's departments, law enforcement, uh, offices around the country either don't have good data collection or it's just in a form that people can't use. Uh, now, I don't necessarily fault all the departments on that because I know here in the federal government with all the resources we have, uh, it has been really hard to just get our data systems and IT and all that set up. Uh, some of you may remember uh, we had a, a little problem with my health care initiative uh, when it came to uh, data and computers and so forth. So, so imagine if you've got a small county, small budget, they've got old computers, they, they don't know how to work systems. But this is an area where we think we can actually make real progress is to help departments all across the country to, to put their data in a way that they can use, but also uh, creates greater systems of accountability. Uh, and, and so we understand what happens. And, and th one of the encouraging things uh, for me is, is that this is an area, when I was a state legislature, I was able to work with uh, the Fraternal Order Police and, and uh, the, the, the state uh, police organizations as well as activists to create a, a racial profiling bill that gathered data and, I, and allowed law enforcement to identify where do they think there's a problem. And because of that cooperation, we've seen improvement in Illinois uh, around these areas. And, and, and that's uh, something that I think we all have to spend some time thinking about. Uh, next, we're going to continue to examine how we as a federal government can work effectively with local communities because we've got 1,800, uh, 18,000 different law enforcement entities. And we're not going to be able to uh, do for a sheriff's department or a police department what it needs to be doing. What are the best ways for us to help them do the right thing when they want to do the right thing? And are there ways in which we can support communities to lift up problems when uh, departments are unwilling to adopt some of the best practices uh, that are out there. So we're going to spend some time looking on that. And, and, and finally, there was broad agreement uh, that this needs to be sustained. Uh, I didn't hear anybody around this table suggest that this problem is going to be solved overnight. Because uh, the, the roots of the problems we saw this week date back not just decades, they back centuries. Uh, there, there, there are cultural issues and there are issues of race in this country and uh, poverty and, and a whole range of problems that will not be solved overnight. But what we can do is to set up the kinds of uh, respectful conversations that we've had here, not just in Washington but around the country, so that uh, we institutionalize a process of continually getting better and holding ourselves accountable and holding ourselves responsible for getting better. Um, and, uh, and, and I think we've done that with the task force, but what's been apparent is, is that it's not enough just for us to have a task force, a report, and then follow up through our departments. We have to push this out into communities so that uh, they feel ownership uh, uh, for uh, some of the good ideas that have been floated around this table. Uh, so I just want to say uh, how encouraged I am by the conversation. Uh, to the American people, I, I want you to know that uh, 
this is a pretty representative group of, uh, of the folks who have been involved in the debate uh, in this issue and, and have practical knowledge and are, are thinking each and every day uh, about how we can prevent the tragedies we saw in Baton Rouge and uh, in uh, Minnesota and in Dallas. Uh, and the conversation that took place around this table is very different than the one that you see on a day-to-day -day or hourly basis uh, in the media. And, and, and one of the things that I encouraged everybody here uh, to do was to try to be as thoughtful and, and, and respectful uh, outside of this room as, as folks were to each other uh, during the course of this conversation. Um, because I, I think the American people would feel more encouraged. Now, I, 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 as I said yesterday, I, I do not want to gloss over the fact that not only are there very real problems, but there are still deep divisions about how to solve these problems. Uh, I, there's no doubt that police departments still feel embattled and unjustly uh, accused. And there is no doubt that my minority communities, communities of color, uh, still feel like it just takes too long to do what's right. And, and the, the pace of change uh, is going to feel too fast for some and too slow for others. And, and sadly, because this is a huge country, that is very diverse, and we have a lot of police departments. I think it is fair to say that we will see more tension in police uh, between police and communities uh, this month, next month, next year, and for quite some time. The, the, the one thing I think we all have to do, though, is not paper over those differences or paper over those problems, but we do have to try to constructively solve them and not simply win talking point arguments uh, and, 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 and not just uh, give voice to uh, what we're feeling at the moment. Uh, we, we, we have to, as a country, sit down and just grind it out, solve these problems. Uh, and I think they, if we have that kind of sustained commitment, uh, I'm confident we can do so. All right? So thank you all for participating. It was a terrific conversation. Uh, and uh, they've all promised to, uh, to take Michelle's call if, if she's wondering why I was late for dinner. All right? <laughs>